especially in another language. So this is uh, Learning English with the German Heart Institute, ninth edition, edition transposition, and we have the chapter Baffle Leaks and Stenosis After Atrial Switch. <laughs> now, it is really a complex anatomy which we have to tackle now after atrial switch and if you have a look at these staircases of the German Heart Institute, sometimes perhaps you can imagine a little bit, you never know exactly where goes where, in which way and so on and uh, this reminds me a little bit um, <coughs> at the situation which we have in the atria in um, a Senning or Mustard procedure. Therefore, I have to bother you with these pictures which probably you all know um, because all several years or so, you uh, open your textbook and try to understand what really happens there in the atria. And this is crucial if you want to do an intervention afterwards. So um, I would like to repeat, I know it was a topic in the m uh, during the morning, I would like to repeat some crucial uh, things in this operation technique. And if we have a first look at this picture, at this picture here, then you see what the surgeon has already done. He has opened the right atrium, he has opened the atrial septum here. This is the atrial septum. This is the anterior portion of the atrial septum. This is the tricuspid valve. By the way, here is the head and there are the feet of the patient, of course. This is the superior carpal vein, the inferior carpal vein. And this gap here is the enlarged atrial septal defect. There's almost the whole septum resected drawsily. And now you see here the dotted line and the pericardial baffle, which now has to be soon at into the dorsal wall of the left atrium. So remember this, there is a baffle, a patch, which is soon to the free wall of the left atrium at this dorsal part, forming a roof or a hood over these left pulmonary veins. And then th in the second stage, this baffle, which is soon to the dorsal wall here, is flipped around. Here it is soon to the right atrial free wall around the superior carpal vein and then at the end it is sutured with this atrial septal remnant, the anterior atrial septum. On the other side the same. Here it is fixed to the free atrial wall on the free atrial wall of the right side around the inferior carpal vein and then it takes over to the atrial septum and this is um, as it is then. And because Normally we don't see the patient in this position. Um, we should, for the angiographies which will follow, keep in mind that we have to turn around these pictures. So the head of the patient is in our angiograms, of course, here, and the feet are here. So the baffle has to be expected to be orientated in this way. And um, I show you, hopefully, one of these angiographies which uh, worked very fine, yeah, there it is. Um, so this is an, um, an geography of, I don't know why it doesn't work really properly, but never, never mind, you can see what I wanted to show you. You see these calcification here, and this is a calcified baffle, um, very good corresponding to our picture here on the left. So this calcification marks um, the separation of the pulmonary venous blood coming through this orifice, more or less, and the way of the venous return, which comes here under this calcification and through this calcification here to the left ventricle. Now, um, this is the substrate for stenosis and leaks. And uh, now if we go more into detail into the literature, then we have to, to question several things. What is the incidence of these leaks and stenosis? How many studies are already published? And what is the gold standard of treatment? And, well, as it is often in congenital heart disease, what is the incidence is relatively easy to um, answer. We don't know. The second is uh, not so easy, but how many studies are published? Well, there are no studies. There are only case reports. There are only anecdotal stories. There are sometimes series of four patients two patients, one patient, and what is the gold standard of treatment? Well, try to answer by yourself. Um, the largest series is from Boston, hmm, no, not quite, it is from Leipzig, it's from Ingo Dehnert. 
And uh, in Berlin, he's well known because he worked in Berlin. And he published 13 long-term survivors where he perf they performed quite a lot of um, interventions, closing leaks, and dilating obstructions. Now, in the preparation for this talk, I tried to get out our data, and we found 16 patients with 20 interventions in 12 years. So it is not so often. And these patients all were adults, and we had 10 leaks and 10 obstructions. So this is the huge background of my talk. Now, I would like to start with baffle obstructions. And um, when we have baffle obstructions of the, of the systemic veins, of the caval veins, then we have superior obstructions, inferior obstructions, and I would like to divide these superior obstructions into primary and secondary obstruction. I will explain this in a minute. Now, <coughs> this is the echo of a superior carval vein. What you can see here is um, a pacemaker lead in the superior carval vein. Because it is a transesophageal echo, of course, this portion here is the pulmonary vein compartment, and this is the superior carval vein um, going into the systemic venous baffle. And here you see some green color uh, marking perhaps an obstruction but perhaps only a little bit turbulent flow. How, how can we assess whether there's really an obstruction behind? Um, well, we do an angiogram and we see this picture. And well, hmm, tja, it's not very wide. This is surely a little bit dilated, but is this enough for obstruction or is it just a morphologic narrowing? Um, it's good to know that you have several projections and if you, well, First of all, if we transpo uh, transform this picture to that picture, then we ha have to, to bear in mind that this is un un our angulation of the TEE probe. And if we have this angulation and put it into this X-ray image, then you can see that the view plane of the TE is really longitudinally through this cross-section. Mm -hmm. And then you see that we have a view perpendicular to this shadow of the angiogram, angiogram corresponding to um, this picture again, so we, cr we have a cross check in the echo here, <laughs> and we have um, a shadowing there. But if we tilt our plane a little bit and do an angio again, then we see that there is indeed a narrowing, and uh, the pressure measurements uh, reveal that there is um, hemodynamic stenosis with uh, no zero flow here, continuous flow, and a gradient of about six millimeters of mercury. And uh, then, of course, you can put in a stent. But be aware there's a pacemaker lead, so perhaps it's better to take out first the pacemaker lead, put in then the stand, and then introduce the pacemaker lead, um, a new one. Well, we will see this patient later on because you al already have seen here is a uh, solely safe occluder in a baffle leak. Now, uh, baffle obstruction of the inferior carval vein, this is a patient uh, we know already with these heavily calcified baffle, and there is a narrowing producing a gradient of about six millimeters of mercury, which we then treated with a stent. And I remember very well, you see this highly distended uh, inferior carval vein, and I remember when I spoke to the patient before the intervention, I said, well, he had ascites, and uh, I said, well, we will put in the stent, and then the ascites will go away, and you will feel much, much better. And what happened? Half a year after our stent placement, the patient was um, ready for transplantation. Because um, what happened was that both ventricles, who, which were highly compromised already, um, had a burden to take. And when we opened up this, the volume coming back to the left ventricle even increased. And I think this was perhaps a further step to the complete deterioration of that heart, um, leading him to a transplant list, which he didn't want, and then um, subsequently, uh, two or three years later, he died. Now, this is a to total occlusion of this SVC, and this is what I uh, would like to address as secondary baffle obstruction, because what you see here is, let, me, let us see it again, that you see the superior carval vein, there are some uh, contrast going into the Aetzigos vein, and there is an obstruction very high in the SVC. 
And uh, secondary, I think, is this, because there was an airing at this point, and then due to these pacemaker leads and the thrombot thrombogenic potential of these uh, leads, uh, the thrombotic uh, region expanded higher and higher. So this is uh, the full extent. There is a stop, and here you see the catheter in the inferior, uh, coming from the inferior, uh, from this <coughs> inferior caval vein, and there is a stop. Now, what can we do there? Of course, we can try to recanalize it, and uh, this proves that uh, the origin of this problem is a bethel stenosis, which then thrombosed. Here it is partially recanalized by this catheter, which is already advanced a few millimeters um, um, distance to the catheter coming from below. And to get through this, in this case, we used a transeptal needle to dissect this, and uh, we were lucky that we really got uh, the connection into the right buffer chamber. So you see here the angiogram and the contrast medium uh, going into the right in the, in the mitral, to the mitral valve. And of course, if you once have established this, you can dilate the stenosis and then put in a stent. And in fact, in this case, um, we implanted two stents and uh, got a good continuation. And what did you see here? What didn't we do? We did not extract the pacemaker leads before we implanted the stents, so we just put them aside uh, with the stents squeezed to the wall of the uh, caval vein. So extraction of these leads will be practically impossible by catheter means, and uh, whenever these leads get problems, um, we will be forced to set in new pacemaker leads. Now, baffle obstructions of the pulmonary veins, how is that um, to be imagined? Well, if we have this uh, picture again, the pulmonary veins by themselves are not tackled by the surgical technique. They are native, so it is very improbable that uh, the stenotics are at the orifice of the pulmonary veins. No, it is the separation of two, two compartments of this um, pulmonary vein uh, return to the tricuspid valve. There is the compartment drawsally directly in front of the orifices, and there is a second compartment um, directly in front of the tricuspid valve, and the sutures and the baffle itself could cause a narrowing. Yeah. Now, I have to admit, we have no experience with these. Um, well, we have one patient in our series who had a serious um, pulmonary venous baffle um, obstruction, but we have no experience in interventions, so I had to look to for the literature, and I found, found uh, two examples, which are both very old, from 1993 and 1994, from the same institution from Ottawa, from um, Martin Hosking, and uh, these are really interesting interventions which he performed. Um, you see here the dorsally located pulmonary baffle portion, and this is the anteriorly uh, portion to the tricuspid valve. And the narrowing is in between. Probably here is the baffle and the, um, the way the, the caval venous blood is going through. Now, what did they do? In this case, they came from the jugular vein through the baffle, through a baffle leakage into the pulmonary venous uh, compartment, and then put in a stent in this narrowing. And there was a relief. However, this was a four-year-old boy, and there's no, um, and this is about t 10 millimeters in diameter. So um, I don't know what uh, then happened afterwards after, well, what, how it's going today. And the second case is uh, a case where they had the similar anatomic problem, and they dilated uh, the stenosis by a retrograde approach through the aortic, um, through the aorta, into the right ventricle, through the tricuspid valve, and then they implanted this stent there. This was a nine-year-old child, if I'm informed right. Now, our patient with the buffalo obstruction of the pulmonary veins, or of the pulmonary venous compartment, um, was a patient with 22 years of age. He was not bad with exercise tolerance, and he had a gradient of 25 millimeters of mercury in the, um, uh, at the course of the pulmonary venous blood from here to, he to here. And what you see, the gradient was 25 millimeters of mercury, but the pulmonary hypertension was considerably. He already had 80 millimeters of mean atrial pressure in the pulmonaries. Um, that is almost systemic pressure. 
So what did we do? Um, in that case, we discussed it and we decided to operate it. Of course, well, which kind of operation is perhaps possible? I thought in that time that we could perhaps take um, make a takedown at an atrial switch, uh, arterial switch. However, we decided the other way around because, as we will hear today later on, that pulmonary hypertension in TGA sometimes is something intrinsic. So that this pulmonary hypertension is probably is perhaps not going back afterwards, and the benefit for this patient is perhaps then not very high. We had the luck 10 years later, after a successful operation, to have cath pressure measurements, and you see what happened. 10 years later, he has a left ventricular pressure of 28 peak pressure and a normal pulmonary pressure as well. So theoretically, it would have been possible. Now, we make a break. Before we come to Bethel leaks, I would like to say, Bethel, what does this word mean? I always ask me, what does Bethel mean? And uh, my children allowed me to go in the Leo Online Dictionary English German today, and I looked at what Bethel is all about, and it was very informative, because the first, well, there were, of course, many translations, but the first was very good. <laughs> Bethel means <laughs> Bethel. Okay, and then I tried the second one. It was not the, f the second, but I found it as a trans translation. Bethel is hindernis, which means in English, obstacle. And this is quite the way we had it just seen, but I don't think that this was the intention when um, people created the word Bethel for atrial switch. So I, I looked a little bit more down the page, and there was the verb to Bethel. What means to Bethel? And there was a quite interesting explanation. To Bethel means Grubengas durch Bewetterung unschädlich machen. So this is uh, difficult to translate, but I think, <laughs> Chuck, um, it means something like in the mining industry, if you have dangerous gases there, you have to, to, uh, to, to, well, to make them explode under controlled conditions so that no more harm to this. Well, it's difficult to translate. Well, then I found something which uh, is not bad. Bethel is Trennwand Ablenkplatte. This is a, a wall which separates two compartments. <coughs> okay, now second part, Bethel leaks. Where are these Bethel leaks? Just keep in mind what I said at the beginning. This Bethel is soon here to the free wall and here to the atrial septum, the remnant of the atrial septum here called limbus. And if we now take a TE picture zero degree, so this is a transversal slice through the thorax, then you have more or less a picture through that region, and you see here the narrowing of the uh, inflow of the caval veins, and this here is the broad compartment of the pulmonary veins. And if you go a little bit more down, I hope this works now, then you see the baffle um, at the level of the AV valves, and this course of the baffle shows you that uh, here has to be a connection between the, the patch which the surgeon used and the original atrial septum at this level. Just keep it in mind. Now, this is a baffle leak. As always, the pulmonary uh, venous compartment is uh, next to the transducer and TEE. Um, this is about uh, longitudinal sagittal view, and uh, here is the sinus, the, the caval veins, and there is a huge defect, and what you can see here is that there is no rim at dorsally because this is the portion where the baffle is directly sutured to the free atrial wall. And if you translated this view to this here, then of course you first have to turn this picture around because in this view, the head of the patient is here, the feet of the patient are here, so we have to turn this. I would like to do this. So the head in this picture now is here, the feet there, the belly is here. And if we now try to, to find this view in this picture, then we can say that the slice is just this cross of tissue here is about this portion of the baffle here. 
if we just put, um, if we just turn a little bit more leftward the transducer, then we will see the, the sinus, the caval vein blood continuing into this way. And if we turn a little bit more to the right, we will see the pulmonary vein blood going over here. And there, at this region where the baffle is sutured directly to the posterior wall of the atria, there we have a defect. Now, what are the implications of this? When we do a sizing maneuver, because hemodynamically we have an ASD, um, then we see that this lack of rim is uh, seen in the um, sizing balloon as well. There is a small indentation at the dorsal wall is nothing. If you look from the lateral view, there's the sheer wall, back wall of the right atrium, and here is an indentation uh, at the in the front. Now, we have no device which really fits in here. And so when we put in a device like an atrial septal occluder, for example, here, you see the dye is going here through um, at, the, at the posterior wall of the atria, and uh, it does not fit very well. If we have an angiogram, you see it even better that this is not optimal, and you have really to ask whether this is a stable position of your device. And um, what you have to do, of course, is to do this wiggle maneuver, and you see you can pull a lot, and it is stable, because um, despite the lack of rim in this region, it is a slit-like defect, and with the occluder large enough, um, it might be stable, and it is stable, and uh, normally uh, you get a good result. Well, you can try to get a, another occluder, for example, in um, muscular VSD occluder. He hasn't so much, uh, so much, uh, well, the, the rim of the occluder itself is smaller than in the atrial septal uh, occluder. This is, of course, better. And what you can do, which I uh, will not show you, uh, you can use a membranous VSD occluder as well with, uh, um, but, he ha but this occluder has smaller rims, so you have to be very sure that it is uh, really fixed there where it should be. Now, there are, of course, other rims. There are sometimes baffle leaks, like here, where you have uh, a real ASD with rims on both sides, and this is, of course, very helpful, as you see in this uh, balloon. There you can put another device, for example, a solely safe occluder, which now is not no longer available, but uh, it shows that uh, this works very fine there. We place it there, and then uh, this is the, resu the result. And this is difficult to see why there, at this portion, uh, you have on all sides a free wall. So the sutures have to be a little bit uh, another way than uh, in the textbook. Well, all these occluders which I have shown you are more or less horizontally orientated. This one is in a baffle leak as well, and, it, and it is more in the cranial caudal direction. Why is this the case? It is a anterior location of the defect. Um, if we have a look to the baffle, here it is close to the tricuspid valve. This is the remnant of the atrial septum. Here is the baffle connect, the, the pericardial patch connected. And if here, when here is uh, an, a hole, then you put it in in this uh, portion of the septum, and then you get this orientation of the um, device, practically there. So in the trans thoracic echo, you see this device here, and because it was a huge defect, the device is relatively narrow, and well, it, it's huge, of course, and you see that it is really narrow to the tricuspid valve here, and to the mitral valve as well, and this is, of course, um, a function of the size of the remnant atrial septum, what is possible here or not. Now then, there are other locations of baffles like these, uh, these are these uh, diffuse small baffles. This is an injection into the superior carpal vein, and here you see diffuse uh, dye going into the pulmonary vein baffle. Um, you can see it with these two catheters on two different locations going through the baffle. So then there are smaller ones, and you see um, um, coronary veins coming up um, with dye there, so it has connections to that as well. And um, this is really difficult to tackle with a device. So what you can do then, you can implant a covered stent and just seal this region. Um, and this uh, patient, there was a slight, in it, a slight stenotic area there at the same time, so that we could tackle both problems with one device. Now at the end, I would like to ask, 
Baffle leaks all to be closed in the cath lab, or are there any baffle leaks which, beside the technical problems, perhaps uh, remain open? And the question is, what happens to the near-failing right ventricle when a baffle leak is closed? Because the more the right ventricle is failing, tricuspid insufficiency is, uh, is increasing, the more the shunt volume will increase, the, the higher the burden for the left ventricle will be um, beside the pressure which is applied through the tricuspid insufficiency, the volume overload by the uh, recirculation through the buffle um, can be considerably as well. And I think you have to really to consider this every time when you have a borderline right ventricle because um, I think this is my one of my last slides. Um, your patient can be on this line. Here you see the end diastic volume. Here you have the, the, the stroke volume. And if your patient is on this line here at the top, every increase in end diastatic volume, which, which would be the case if you, um, if you close the baffle, increase in volume for the right ventricle can lead to a decrease in stroke volume and, in fact, to heart failure. So, in conclusion, baffle leaks and stenosis are for atrial switch are well described. The absolute numbers, however, are small. They can be successfully treated by transcatheter interventions, and they have to be treated with caution in patients with failing ventricles. 